Leadership. All my life, I've been fascinated by what makes a good leader. Are good leaders born or made? Can leadership be taught? How do leaders lead if people don't trust to even listen? I grew up in Arkansas. Now I live and work in the innovation heartland of Northern California. During these past years of constant crisis, I've thought more deeply about leadership and what it takes to lead people, especially when trust is in limited supply. That's why I decided to create this podcast and reach out to changemakers from different disciplines to hear what they have to say. As the host of this show, the most important things I can do are two things I learned in medical school, to ask good questions and then listen. Hello, I'm Lloyd Miner, Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine, and welcome back to the Miner Consult. It's my privilege to welcome this week's guest, psychiatrist and neuroscientist, Dr. Thomas Insel, former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Since stepping down from that role in 2015, he's led the mental health team at Verily, co-founded a Silicon Valley startup, MindStrong Health, to address mental illness, and recently helped launch Humanist Care, a therapeutic online community for recovery. Earlier this year, he published his book, Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health which explores the mental health crisis in the United States and what can be done about it. Thank you so much for joining me, Tom. Lloyd, a real pleasure to be here. I'm so glad we could do this. Great. So Tom, your path to medicine began earlier than most. You'd completed most of the pre-medical requirements by the age of 17, but then you took a detour to travel the world. What made you decide to do that? And what lessons from your travels as a teenager have informed your career? Oh my gosh, that is a long time ago. As I like to say, that was in the late Pleistocene. I, I was uh, I was way too young to go to medical school. I you know I, I don't think I was shaving yet, so I was not ready to actually um, start thinking about wearing a white coat and 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 seeing patients. Um, so I needed to I needed to broaden myself. I had already gone through college. I knew. Um, that I had a lot of interests and a lot of ambition, but I had I, I knew I wasn't ready uh, to to take on uh, a medical school curriculum. So I I found a bunch of different uh, volunteer roles in, in hospitals and clinics. Uh, one in Hong Kong, one in India, a couple of other opportunities, and I decided to just travel and get a sense of what the rest of the world looked like. This was during the Vietnam War, so uh, I was too young to be drafted. So I, I had this uh, opportunity to actually be able to do something without uh, being attached to a university, because at that time you'd get drafted if you weren't, uh, and you might even be drafted if you were. So it was um, it was a great experience, though, in that I I did get a real sense of what poverty looked like. Um, I got a sense of just how diverse the world was and how how sheltered I'd been growing up in a suburb of Washington D.C. Um, and really having no exposure. Um, to just the range of experiences, the range of cultures, the range of, uh, of, of ways of living that uh, I began to see, particularly in rural India, in Bihar, one of the poorest areas of India where um, they were living not in a way that wasn't really much different than they would have been um, several hundred years ago, even thousands of years ago. So. Um, part of that, by the way, Lloyd, was I wasn't sure I actually wanted to go to medical school. And that experience of working in a hospital, um, holding a flashlight through complicated surgeries where 30 or 40 percent of our patients died on the table. Uh, we lost people to neonatal sepsis because they would, you know, they, the way you uh, clot the umbilical cord when during birth was to use cow dung. Um, and so losing uh, lots of babies and lots of kids to snake bites and things like that, uh, it was, God, I learned so much and was such a deepening experience. By the time I was 18, I uh, felt like I had had quite an education. Indeed. And when you did begin your training as a physician and a scientist, you chose to focus on the human mind, both through research in neurobiology and through clinical psychiatry. As a fellow physician scientist, I'm interested to learn what first attracted you to study the brain through the lenses of biology and human behavior, and what made you decide to devote your career to this work? 
Well, I got exposed to some fantastic teachers early on. Uh, there was this guy at MIT, Wally Nauda, who was iconic at the time. I don't think anybody remembers him, but he was, he was a brilliant, brilliant teacher who took the somewhat, I don't know, you could say technical field of neuroanatomy and made it utterly fascinating. He just like lit it up in a way that no one had ever done for me. So I became really interested in neuroscience, partly because of Dr. Nauda. Um, and I wasn't even at MIT, but he had taught a night course, a three hour lecture that he did, which was mesmerizing. It was just like a mini series, it was phenomenal. And then um, uh, later on, uh, having that same kind of an experience uh, with Norm Geshwin, who was a professor of neurology, uh, and who was very interested in kind of what we then called behavioral neurology, this kind of area of, uh, of studying aphasias and apraxias and odd syndromes uh, that are due to cortical lesions. And between those two teachers, I just got completely mesmerized by, uh, really not just by the mind, but by the cortex and, and trying to understand how does the brain and, the, and how do the brain and mind talk to each other and, and how does all that happen uh, and frankly I wasn't a great student I was actually a mediocre student I never could actually make it through all of Harrison's I didn't memorize the book the way that most people did uh, to do really well as a medical student but I love the neuroscience part and that part neurology and psychiatry and I didn't really separate them to me they were one kind of one subject um, that really was where I became passionate. That's great. The National Institute of Mental Health had many accomplishments during your 13-year tenure as the director and leader, and that includes establishing autism as a major area of focus and funding some of the first large genotyping and sequencing efforts to identify genes that put an individual at risk for mental illness, to name just two of the many accomplishments. What are you most proud of from your tenure as director? Well, you, you know, um, those things you just mentioned um, were not just NIMH. Lots of institutes were doing large-scale genotyping efforts. And, you know, what all of us did at the NIH, we had 27 directors, so I had lots of colleagues. And all of us kind of go where there's the most traction scientifically. You, you go for the most recent technical breakthroughs that let you answer questions in new ways. And so for me, I think part of it was that opportunity. More than that, I think, you know, what I'm most proud of really is probably the people I was able to bring on board in the time I was there. An incredibly talented group of people. The NIH doesn't pay that much. You know, the, the work is sometimes really difficult and, and kind of, it's not, it's not as glamorous and it certainly isn't as appreciated as the work that happens in lots of other academic environments. But the people who do it are spectacular, and they're really committed, and they're really there for a mission. And so finding those people and supporting them and helping them to succeed, that was, that's the thing I'm most proud of. And I still think most of them are there doing great stuff, even though I'm, I'm long gone. You, you spoke about uh, how oftentimes we shift our emphasis in, in science and medicine based upon emerging technologies, based upon new opportunities. And one of the shifts that occurred at NIMH during your tenure as director was a shift from a focus that was principally on behavioral research to a focus that was more geared towards neuroscience and genetics. Um, this was certainly uh, a shift for the NIMH. Um, and can you talk about that change and what was your thinking behind it and how was it received by the broader community? Oh, yeah. Actually, I, I can't really take either credit or blame for that because it really happened before I got there. It was my predecessor, Steve Hyman, who uh, took all the hits. I like to give him the credit. But he took the NIMH from an institute that had been largely funding a small group of senior psychiatrists to do clinical trials that were comparing Coke and Pepsi. That's a I'm, a, I'm being a little cynical, but it wasn't a great period, I think, for the institute. Um, and he changed it to say, no, we need, we need other people. We need people who have scientific training. We need people who have a deep understanding of, <clears throat> of, uh, of how to do uh, hard experiments. And, and that included 
people who came from neuroscience, people who came from genetics, but also cognitive scientists and behavioral scientists who were doing, at that point, far more rigorous work than what had happened in the previous generation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was unpopular, it's always unpopular when you move funding from team A to B, team B. But what Steve and I did, and I think it's continued since then, is to find the next generation of really talented um, scientists who brought in different sorts of skills. And even within genetics, I mean, we, gosh, both of us, but me in particular, I think we pissed off a lot of the people in psychiatric genetics because I kept saying, look, this is really hard to do. Let's start with the people who've actually solved the similar problem for diabetes or for Crohn's disease or for asthma, like they, you know, or maybe for breast cancer. They've actually figured out how to do this and they've succeeded. Our team has never figured out any of this and they haven't succeeded. Why not bring in the people who actually know how to do this and get them to work on our problem instead of hoping that the same people who hadn't really been able to succeed would finally figure it out by reading those people's papers. So we, we did that, uh, both Steve, Steve did it to some extent, I think I did it a little bit more, and it was remarkably successful. What we, you know, we've taken, both of us took a lot of flack, and you do that when you're a director who's leading instead of following, if you're trying to move the field in a new direction, and you know that as, as dean, you always get more credit and more blame than you deserve. And it's, it's that way when you're an institute director, what I think is where we got a, where I got a lot of heat, mostly later, was from people who felt we weren't putting enough into clinical trials. And where it wasn't behavioral research per se, I'm a behavioral scientist. Mm -hmm. That was my background. That's, I actually pushed the whole field of social neuroscience as a behavioral, an aspect of behavioral neuroscience. <clears throat> so I, I think that continued to prosper during those years. But the world of doing clinical trials on drug A versus drug B without really any understanding of the mechanism of either drug just didn't seem to me to be a great investment. And so we moved to what was called experimental medicine. And we asked people, if you're gonna come into the NIMH to do clinical research, clinical trial anyway, here's an idea. Start with a mechanism. Start with something that you think is the way this treatment works because if you don't do that, the negative results aren't helpful. So show us how you're going to learn from negative results because otherwise all we're doing is biasing you to get something you can publish that's positive and will never be replicated. So we, we, we did turn off a lot of people who were doing the same kind of clinical trials they'd always done. And they didn't like being challenged to have to think about coming up with a different way, this sort of experimental medicine paradigm. They also didn't like the fact that we weren't totally enamored of the diagnostic system, the DSM, as a way of trying to understand biology because that really didn't have anything to do with biology. And so we invited the field to say, here's an idea, collect the data, biological, psychological, social data, and then figure out how, how these disorders actually aggregate. Where are the right boundaries? Where are the right syndromes? And how should we define these? Because just using clinical symptoms, it's not really getting us there. Um, that was not that popular at the time. A lot of people now have kind of jumped onto that. Still a work in progress though, and I don't think we've proven out that that approach has yet really paid out either. We still have to figure this out. Absolutely. In your new book, which I highly recommend to all those who are listening, I, I learned tremendously from it, and it's brilliantly written, and the stories that you incorporate are so informative. And you wrote very eloquently about the disconnect we're seeing in this country between the progress scientists are making in understanding the biology of mental illness and the growing number of Americans suffering from mental health conditions and oftentimes the devastating and social and personal impacts of those conditions. And uh, again, you, a number of stories in that book are so powerful in, in showing those effects. So can you talk about why we're experiencing this disconnect? Yeah, it's, it's really the reason for the book is I couldn't figure out how with so much progress in science and, and having really good treatments, some of them medical, some of them psychological, some of them more rehabilitative, but they work. 
and having more people in treatment than ever before, like, why were the results so bad at a public health level? Why was suicide up 30%? Why were more people incarcerated and unemployed? Why were all the public health numbers going in the wrong direction when all the science was going in the right direction? And I, I really struggled with that. And, and that took me two or three years in writing this book, talking to a lot of people, visiting a lot of places, both in the US and Europe and elsewhere, to try to answer that question. And what I came around to was, um, I guess the simplest way to say this is, um, the problem may be medical, but the solutions are more than medical. That um, we're not bending the curve on a public health sense because the solutions that we need are not currently part of our healthcare system. I had conflated or I'd confuse mental health and mental health care. And now I have this sense that mental health care as we know it today, that you know the medicines and the psychotherapies, those are very important, but they account for only a small percentage of our outcomes. That if we want to get better outcomes, reducing suicide, improving uh, the rate of employment, improving recovery, we have to focus on what I call the three Ps, people, place, and purpose. We have to give people social support. We have to, they have to have housing. They have to have a safe environment in which to recover. And they have to have a reason to recover. Those three things are things that we do brilliantly in the world of psychosocial supports. There are clubhouses and ACT teams and supported employment, supportive housing, all that stuff that works brilliantly. But we don't pay for it with healthcare dollars. Uh, and so what we've where we've failed is we've limited healthcare to a very kind of narrow medical model, which I think works brilliantly in infectious disease and probably in cardiovascular medicine and lots of other places. In behavioral health, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it's, it, it works to a limited extent, but it's not nearly enough. We have to do the medical model plus this recovery model, which provides the, the people, place, and purpose to be able to really bend the curve. One of the things you, you talk about in your description of, of uh, the current situation in America is that when there was a move towards deinstitutionalization uh, and more towards caring for people with mental illness, with, uh, with issues related to mental health, when there was a move away from institutions, there was not, in fact, the, quite the opposite. There was also a move to limit the community resources in mental health. You describe your work in a community mental health center and, and how meaningful it was, and then how uh, how we've really shrunk in in the country the number of community mental health centers and and then the devastating consequences that has had. And of course, that gets into what you just mentioned about uh, the public health consequences of of not sort of addressing these social, environmental, behavioral-related determinants of health. How are we going to turn that around in our country? And uh, where are you optimistic uh, that changes are occurring? Well, we can't turn it around. We absolutely can. I mean, people ask me, <clears throat> where, where, do, where do we do mental health really well? I usually say 1975, right? Yeah. Because it, it, we used to do this far better than we do today. We weren't great, by the way. We didn't, I, know, I wouldn't say that we... We did everything right back then, but we were accountable. We had continuity. We had capacity. We had a lot of stuff that today we lack. You know, when I started off, which was in the mid 70s, the idea of incarcerating people with serious mental illness would have been unimaginable. The, the idea of allowing people to become homeless, um, it, it just like the, the things we do today and we kind of find acceptable were, were, were just truly beyond the pale in the mid-70s because we were so committed to making sure patients got reasonable care in the community. And all that is gone for the most part. And today, and as everyone knows, the, mental, the, the criminal justice system has become the de facto mental health care system. There are 10 times more people who are incarcerated with serious mental illness than hospitalized right now in our public system. That's outrageous. That's just completely unacceptable. But I'm hopeful because we know what to do. And it's the stuff that we used to do. It are the, there are these ACT teams, the assertive community treatment teams. There are clubhouses. 
we know how to give people the kind of housing and the kind of job training that they crave and that they will recover with. The problem is we're not supporting that. So I've just launched a yet another startup, Lloyd, another right. one. <laughs> I can't seem to stop doing this. But I had this idea that if we take all of those pieces and we glue them together and we create a kind of safety net, remember that term, safety net? Sure. But this is a safety net for people with serious mental illness. And we provide the connective tissue because there already are people doing, in some parts of the country, great work with ACT teams and great work with clubhouses, but they're not connected. And they don't connect to the medical system at all, which is a huge problem because most of these people with serious mental illness, they die 20 years early of COPD and diabetes and a bunch of common chronic medical problems that we're not managing well. So we need to give them really good health care as well. We can do that. And we think we can do that and actually save the healthcare system an enormous amount of money. Vana Health is a new startup. It's just launching. It's still basically in stealth, but I just told you about it. And the idea for Vana is to say, hey, let's go out and create that connective tissue. Let's, if, if some of the pieces aren't there, we can build them. We know that by using uh, digital tools and helping people with coaches to connect to each other and to connect to services, we can get much better engagement. Uh, let's put all that into play and let's do it for some of the most expensive, um, high intensity patients that are out there who are not engaged in care until they get into a crisis and end up in the ER, end up in, in, uh, in hospital, which are the most expensive and most intensive services. Not good for anybody. We can do this much better by moving upstream providing the psychosocial supports, wrapping people in all of those things with peers who actually look and talk and like them and have the same experiences and giving those peers the kind of backup they need. We know we can do this. And so I'm very optimistic. If we can prove this out and create a kind of public-private partnership ultimately to do this at scale, I think we can, we can really change the narrative and we can make sure that people with serious mental illness actually do recover. We know they can recover, but the right care, we know they will recover. One of the most concerning consequences of the pandemic has been the deepening of the mental health crisis in our country, particularly with increases in depression and anxiety for young people. So could you uh, talk to us about what you're seeing there and, um, and what solutions we can implement in real time to counteract these effects? Yeah, so there's a lot going on with the pandemic and it's clear that, uh, especially for young people, just Lloyd, one quick factoid, uh, for if you look at COVID deaths, for people under the age of 30, we've had as of today, 7,160 deaths. I think that's the current number. Deaths of despair, suicide and overdoses in the age, same age group, at the same time period, about 90,000 deaths. Mm. So there's no question that the mental health consequences of this have been devastating. Uh, they were, you know, this was a problem that existed before, but it's been hugely accelerated. Those num that 90,000 numbers probably double where we were th four or five years ago. Mm. Big problem, big issue. What do we do? What can we do? I'll tell you what we've done in, or what we're planning to do in California because I think it's a model for the nation. Uh, the governor, with back, backing from the assembly, has put a $4.4 billion commitment into child and youth mental health or behavioral health. And the idea has about 10 moving parts to it, but a major concept of it is to move upstream, to think about prevention, to create, to, to make schools the center of gravity for both early prevention and early detection and even connecting to care, providing telehealth for primary care to have a child psychiatry backup in real time, um, and creating a whole network of services, including some that are online to allow families to navigate the system, which right now is very fragmented. Nobody can get to the care they want. All of that is fixable. So we're making a huge commitment to that in this, in this state. I don't know if we would have done it without the pandemic, but there's no question that the need is there. And I hope that 
other states can look at what California is doing. They probably can't afford to do it at the same scale, but they can take pieces of this and put it into play. One part of it that we feel really strongly about in California is that we're going to need a new workforce. Um, and so we're talking about many, many thousands of people who can be trained up. They may not look like our normal credentialed professional workforce, but they're people who will represent the diversity, both of geography and culture and ethnicity of this very diverse state. They'll come from those communities and they'll work in the school system or hopefully with the school s system in some way to be able to provide the kind of support that, that kids and families need and just haven't been able to get. One of the changes that the pandemic has driven is much more adoption of telehealth in, in healthcare delivery. And certainly that's probably been most profound in, in behavioral health and in psychiatry. Um, one of the themes of, of the startups that you've mentioned and that uh, are doing such exciting work and you've been involved with um, ha has been the application and incorporation of digital health technologies into a suite of services related to um, uh, mental health. Can you, where do you, in your crystal ball, where do you see this going? Um, what, what are digital health tools useful for? Uh, where are their limitations and how does this fit into the broader picture of telehealth and its, its uh, change in the behavioral health landscape? Yeah, those are great questions. We may need another podcast to, <laughs> sure. to do them justice. <laughs> but let me just quickly unpack the way I see it now. First of all, I'd say that mental health is going to be transformed more by digital tools than any other part of medicine. What do we do? I mean, mental health is largely... Uh, communication. It's talking and listening and, and observing. You can do all that remotely and you can do it really well. Maybe in some cases you can even do it better because you can record and you can get uh, natural language processing uh, engines to actually uh, capture a lot of what's going on in a way that's more objective. So I think there's a huge, huge promise here. That said, um, there's also a huge investment. I don't think we've gotten very far in terms of transforming the field. We will, but we're not there. I talk about a five act play and we're in act one. Mm -hmm. Act one is about giving people access. I think we've done that. We've now have multiple companies that didn't exist five years ago. Some of them like Cerebral, 200,000 patients. I think Lyra has about that many. These are massive companies. They're on their way to becoming the largest providers of mental health services in the country. And some of them were not on the map three or four years ago. So that's pretty interesting. But what they've done is largely connect patients who want care to therapists who want patients. They match. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And there's, that's, a, that's progress. It's not enough. Act two is improving quality. So making sure that what those patients are getting when they find a therapist actually has an evidence base to it and it's being given at the dose and with the fidelity that we know is what you need to get good outcomes. So act two is really about improving quality through better measurement, looking at outcomes and training up that workforce to do things in a far better way. Act three is gonna be integrating all that with the healthcare system because right now none of that happens. And then act four and act five, we have to really get to the hard problem which I talked about with Vana Health, which is how do we actually deal with those people who aren't engaged in healthcare? How do we engage those who aren't looking for this, but who need it the most, the most, uh, you know, really high utilizers who end up just getting into the healthcare system when they're in crisis. So those last two acts are gonna be around serious mental illness and really transforming the entire care system so that we include all of these issues around psychosocial needs and a range of other uh, other factors. I'm incredibly hopeful that we're on that journey. I think it's gonna happen much more quickly than most people realize. A lot of it is gonna depend on where the incentives are and what we're paying for, because if we pay for innovation, this will get done. Absolutely. What are you most excited about in terms of the next decade of research in behavioral health, neuroscience, the clinical treatment of mental illness? And within that, sphere of research, what's going to be the appropriate role for the private sector and for the public sector? Because you've been a leader in both. Um, so how do you, you see the two working together to really have the transformative impact that I believe we all think we can have uh, with the research opportunities that are available? 
Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you put it that way. It's a public-private question. I did a piece last week for Science Magazine about um, maybe the time has come for a public-private partnership for behavioral health the way we did this for COVID. I mean, when you see those numbers, the impact, particularly on young people, we're not addressing that at the scale or with the urgency that we need. And maybe this is the moment to bring together the private sector and the public sector. But in this case, the private sector, it's not the pharmaceutical industry, it's the tech industry, yeah. right? right. And, and, and to think with the tech industry in a couple of different ways, some is what I've been talking about, how we create the software and hardware for better services and, and matching and better service delivery and proving access and quality and integration. We can do that. But there's also, I think, a great opportunity to meet young people where they are, which is online. And how do we challenge the social media industry to become part of the solution instead of so much a part of the problem? That's where I think a public-private partnership gets really interesting. And, and to begin that conversation with um, players that haven't really been engaged, Discord, TikTok, you know, where, you know, young people are not on Facebook. <laughs> they may be on YouTube a little bit, but they're largely on Tik, you know, a little bit on TikTok, Discord, and there'll be new things coming along uh, where they're really gonna be engaged. So meeting with them where they are and helping those companies to actually become part of the solution would be so interesting. Uh, you know, getting them to think about what is their social responsibility and what's their opportunity they have bringing in the academic sector to work with them to help define you know what are the what are the what are the interventions that work what can actually be delivered on that kind of a platform uh, and, and then bringing in of course at some point the government to help to understand how this gets regulated how it gets delivered maybe even how it gets paid for i think there's a huge conversation the the fact that we did project warp speed and within eight to nine months came up with a vaccine for a previously unknown viral agent that's pretty awesome if we can do that we ought to be able to make some progress on problems like youth suicide or drug overdoses for young people we've got to be able to think about this in a in a different way Tom, you spent nearly three decades leading organizations devoted to researching the human mind. How did you approach these leadership roles, and what do you consider as the set of vision and priorities for research that will have broad national impact on scientific progress and patient care? Oh, again, these are big questions. My leadership style has always been to um, lead with humility. I mean, um, I always joked, and I think I didn't make up this line, I have so much to be humble about, and so it comes naturally to me to, uh, uh, to ask a lot of questions, to listen, um, and to sort of lead from behind, let other people um, who, who really need and have the ability to shine, let them shine. So I'm one of those leaders who um, prefers to uh, watch others uh, succeed in great ways. That's where I get my, my thrills uh, most of all. In terms of, you know, where, where does this need to go and where should we make the priorities? Um, you know, I still think we need more of a public health agenda for the mental health space. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves um, what's really making a difference at scale population-wise. Uh, so much of what we've invested in and what we, what we do is sort of very high tech and it's academically really interesting, but it will never be used in practice or if it does, it will just make healthcare so much more expensive. So I'd love to, to challenge the field to say, you know, yeah, let's do precision medicine for psychiatry, but let's do it in a way that's affordable. Let's do it in a way that could actually scale to 100 million people and actually get paid for in a way that is, is reasonable and understandable. Um, I, I think the field has gone off in a way that is really much more about publishing papers in very good journals. And that's become an industry in and of itself. The reality is that very few people read those journals <laughs> and very little of that ever goes anywhere beyond the academic community. Sure. Um, and that's pathetic because we need the smartest people on the planet 
to be working on some of the hardest problems in healthcare. And some of those hard problems are in the behavioral health space. So figuring out like, how do we transform diagnosis so that we know how to predict better treatment response, that kind of precision medicine piece. How do we actually bring together the different treatments that we have now to optimize them for care and to actually get better outcomes? How do we shift to a value-based model in a field where we don't measure anything? Like, what are we gonna to start to measure so that people will know how to measure value and then we'll start paying for that? Those are questions which I think are really urgent to answer and I don't see enough attention uh, going to those areas. What are the most important qualities in a leader today from your perspective? Oh, flexibility for sure. Things are moving quickly. I think we've always sort of felt that and said that, but there's um, there's a real need to um, be able to to move uh, with with opportunity and to shift gears. There's also a huge, huge need right now for um, incorporating diversity. Um, you know, this was a big topic at NIH when I was there ten years ago, and there were a lot of people who would sort of thought about diversity as kind of you know hitting some quota or diversity is something you do because um, you know it's the right thing to do that's nonsense I mean I think you need a diverse group of people on your team because you want to succeed it's that you can't succeed with only one point of view you need to hear from people who have very different life experiences and I'm not just talking about race or ethnicity or age, but just a range of different life experiences so that you can get a sense of what actually is going to work. We know this in the tech industry. We're really good. We're really good at user experience. We bring in everybody we need to hear from mm -hmm. before we are ready to, to launch a product. We call that UX. We don't do that in healthcare. In healthcare, we haven't learned to Start with the consumer, start with the user, learn from people what it is they want to buy, what it is they need, and then you can actually be more likely to get to move that public health needle. And I, I, so I, I think we need leaders who are willing to engage in that way uh, and kind of learn from not only the, you know, the usual suspects, but learn from people who haven't often been at the table. And a final question, Tom, what gives you hope for the future? Well, I'm always hopeful. I, I just think there's uh, there's every reason to you know pull your hair out. If I had hair, I would do that. I don't have enough to pull out anymore. But the, but um, the reality is that we've got another generation coming along that is idealistic, um, that does have very different life experiences. Um, and you know, they're willing to really make a difference. They really want to do things better. And so I always look to young colleagues. That's one of the fun things about working in the tech world is uh, everybody is younger than my my children. So I, you know, I, I mostly work with people who are 40 years younger than me. And and that is, um, that's a, a way to remain hopeful because they carry that. Um, you, you could say that they're, they're innocent and naive, and maybe to some extent that's true. But, but we need that too. You know, we need people who still think that they can make big changes if we are gonna make big changes. And um, I, I actually am a huge um, proponent of innovation for, for healthcare. I think um, what we now need to talk about more is innovation for health. And that's the piece that um, I guess I'm pushing on most of all these days. Great. Very well stated. Tom, thank you so much. And thank you for listening to the Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's insightful discussion with neuroscientist, psychiatrist, and entrepreneur, Dr. Thomas Insel. Keep watching and keep learning with me as we continue to look at leadership during a once in a generation crisis. Please send your questions by email to the Minor Consult at theminorconsult.com. And check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. 
Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.